morning. This is Pastor Jan from our house with Pastor Ash. Um, sharing the word today for um, for anybody that's listening, especially um, people that are hungry for the word. Uh, we represent the fellowship of uh, Lord of the Harvest. And so we're really excited that if you could join us this, this day, uh, God is so good. And he keeps revealing to us more and more things in this study of the Psalms. Uh, Pastor Oz has been... Uh, extensively studying, deeply studying the Psalms. And you know, like he's on book five. And I just want to say, book five doesn't mean Psalm five. It's he, the Psalms are divided into five sections. So we are now in the last section and I am reading out of um, 100, Psalm 111, which is really, it stands alone. You don't even have to really comment on it, but I do have a few things I do want to say. So Psalm 111, Praise the Lord. That's how it starts out with praise the Lord. And I think that signifies that we all, that should be the first thing that comes out of our mouth. Praising the Lord. You get up in the morning, praise the Lord. Um, you know, this, 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 this Psalm was sort of divided into, uh, four sections. The first, the first verse centers on a, a vow to give thanks, verse 1. Verse 2 to 4 says, The deeds of the Lord praised. 5 to 9 is about uh, the deeds of the Lord uh, described. And the last the last um, scripture is our introduction to wisdom. What does it take? If you want to be wise, what do you have to do? So let's start out with um, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Not a divided heart. And I think that's so important in this hour. Many of us have divided hearts. We do love the Lord. Some people, in fact, say they're Christians, when in fact, I don't even know what that means. Um, it's like I have a car, I have a house, I have children, I have a good job, and oh, I'm a Christian. It, it's just another thing added onto their list. But God wants our whole hearts. He doesn't want us to, He doesn't want Him to be a tag along. He is first and center, and everything else is a mood point. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, I will praise him in the assembly, which are small groups. It might be in, the, in your home with friends. It might be in our church. And then in the congregation represents larger gatherings. So maybe we have our um, gatherings with um, Detroit Partnership. It's all the churches come together. That's where we could praise the Lord too. So... It's important that we praise in our homes, with our friends, in our church, to go out to larger gatherings. The works of the Lord are great. You know, well, let me keep reading this. Studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. You know, we could go on about his righteousness. It's kind of funny that, um, you know, we just always attribute people, scientists as being ungodly, but there was this uh, man um, who um, made a laboratory in uh, in England, and when you enter his, his uh, I, I think it was an observatory, but I'm not sure, it says he has this engraved above the door. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. So, you know, there are people that just, they can't get over sunsets and, and, and uh, sunrises. And, and, and even when you stop and you look at that, it is an amazing sight. So many things God has done are absolutely amazing. Um, another, uh, a guy said, um, and I think he was a scientist, his name was Kepler. When he first turned his telescope to clustered works, he thinks God said, this is what he thought God's first thoughts were. Um, I'm thinking over again the first thoughts of God. When God saw what he made, can you imagine what he thought? Can you imagine what went through his mind when he created the worlds, created earth, created the garden, created men, created all those animals? What was going through his head? It was amazing, I'm sure. Again, last week we talked about he had a plan. He had a plan when he created um, 
all the animals. He had a plan when he created us. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. You know, we might break our side, but he never breaks his. We might walk away. We know a lot of people that have walked away from God, but he doesn't. He's waiting for a return. We know the story of the prodigal. The prodigal being a, a person that has left God, God being the father, waiting for that person to come back. Um, he has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. I want to pause a minute and turn to Exodus. When I see the, uh, I, 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 when I read this, I got the feeling of Exodus again, of Moses and his people, um, particularly the mention about food. And if you turn to Exodus 16, Turn to verse 2. And then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained to get Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So they're mad at Moses and Aaron as if they did anything. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You know, sometimes we, we mumble and, and we complain. We don't understand God's plan. Let's keep going here. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. And I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Isn't that interesting? God gives us uh, something to do, and, and, it, and it's sort of like a little test where we follow his rules. And it shall be on the sixth day, that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather. So they gather every day, but on the sixth day they're going to gather twice as much because of the Sabbath. And then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. He's going to show you. He's going to give you proof. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? We're just servants too. Why are you complaining against us? And also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us for against, but against the Lord. And then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord. For he has heard your complaints. And now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, can you imagine this? The glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Wow. These people have experienced so much, and yet their hearts are still divided. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Can you imagine God speaking? Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up in the evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. See, God gives us bread every day. Every day. And do we question, what is this? I don't even know what this is. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to one's own need. Omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let each man take for those who are in his tent. And then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, for some of them left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. You see, God gives us things to use when he wants it. And if we don't, it becomes rotten. You you can't save things for the future. You can't say, okay, I, God gave me this word 
I know I'm supposed to give it to Pastor Oz right now. I'm gonna save it and wait five years from now. And it, it, it doesn't work that way. Sometimes words you do sit on when God tells you to. But if he tells you to take something and do something with it, he means it. And so, let's see, now I lost my place. Um, so they gathered So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it all up until morning and Moses, as Moses commanded, and did it not stink, nor were there any worms in it. And then Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, the seventh, there will be no more. Now, what I want to say is many times we just go through life thinking that nothing's going to happen. God isn't going to uh, create or uh, there could be calamity in the earth. And, you know, it makes me laugh too thinking of this. Uh, in our world today, people were stocking up toilet paper, not food. Well, they probably were food too, but... That's kind of funny to me. But anyway, the the point is this. When I think of the story of the, the uh, wise and foolish virgins, some of the foolish virgins thought it didn't really matter that they had oil in their lamps. See, God provides. And in the hour he provides the oil, he gives you oil to burn in your lamps. Oil is the Holy Spirit. You are full. You are ready for whatever comes. Those foolish uh, maids, they weren't. And so you can't borrow the Holy Spirit from somebody. You can't, it's not possible. And what did they say? They said, go and get some, I don't know where, but go. You can't take the Holy Spirit from me. And so I think that in the wilderness, I we know that these people really just didn't get things. They just didn't get things. And they were divided. They had heart, hearts divided. And poor Moses and Aaron, they just kept trudging along, getting frustrated. Poor Aaron got, I mean, poor Moses kept getting angry. Um, but God always keeps his covenant, always keeps his covenant with his people. And even though he knew that they disobeyed, he, he came back to help them in the desert again. So let's go back to Psalms 111. The works of his hands are redity and justice. Verse 7, all his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. They are done in truth in right in uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is it. You say, you know, you might pray, I want to be wise. I want to have wisdom. Well, the beginning is fearing the Lord. The beginning is reverence of the Lord. It's the beginning of all things. You can say, oh, that person's wise. Do they fear the Lord? That's the beginning. You can't get it if you don't start there. You have to start at the beginning to, to get more and more wisdom. So think about those people you think are wise. Are they really wise or not? A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praises endure forever. Now, I'm not going to read the next one, but I would encourage you to read the next psalm because it, it, it's a kind of like a, a pair here. This, these two psalms were written in, in like an acrostic fashion. Uh, like That would mean in our, in our world, you would take the first letter of the alphabet. We'd have 26 lines. I don't know how many letters are in the Hebrew um, alphabet, but they had um, each, each line began with the letter of the Hebrew letter. In both of these psalms, do that. The second psalm is really even more powerful, I think. And I don't want to read it right now. I don't have time for it. The other thing I want to say uh, that goes, that I feel like the Lord really wanted me to share this. Uh, it's in Psalm 23. A really short psalm, but we all know the, 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 the Lord is my shepherd psalm. But I just want to read it real quickly, and I want to make a um, comment at one verse. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So this goes along with the people in the desert. God will provide all our needs if we trust him, love him, follow him, if we do not have a divided heart. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. So sometimes when we are upset, when we are going through things, he makes you to lie down. He makes you to think about him. He makes you to uh, get his peace. Get his peace. He leads me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Either I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You are, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. That's pretty heavy. When we're going through something, God has prepared a luscious banquet for us. Banquet, banquets represent celebrations, victories. And so there he is. He's prepared this table surrounded by enemies. And this is the part I want to focus on. My cup runs over. Do you know, if you took a cup and you started pouring something in it till the liquid ran over, you would have a mess. And I think about, and everyone I know that has children can remember this, when your child spilled Kool-Aid and it went all over the table, down the floor, and you tried to clean it up. It was sticky even after cleaning it the first time. You ended up having to wash the floor because it was sticky. You see, when our cup spills over and it has righteousness in it, it has humility in it, it has wisdom in it, it has the Holy Spirit in it, people are going to stick to it. They're going to stick to it. What's in your cup? Your cup, if it run, runs over, what's it full of? Is it full of God? Is it full of righteousness? If people get stuck in it, are they stuck in good things? Or did you just pull them along into something they shouldn't be in? Think about what's in your cup. Empty it out and refill it with the goodness of God. And it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The thing that is amazing, so amazing to me about our Lord, is that he's a God of second chances. We know that a third chance, a fourth chance. He never stop, He never gives up on us, even though we give up on ourselves. Some of us suffer from depression. We'll sit there and say, I'm no good. I'm this, I'm that. And God says, no, you're not. I created you. I love you. Pick your head up. Look at me. In this hour, there's a lot going on. We need to keep our focus on Jesus. We need to. And make sure your cup is full of the great things of God. May it not be like a cup full of this and that and the other thing. Spill it out and start over. Spill it out. So when it does run over, when that cup runs over, people will be drawn to it. They'll look at it. They'll get stuck in it. And they'll want their cup full with that too. So now is the time for communion. So uh, make sure you have your elements there. And um, we are going to eat the bread first. And Lord, we just thank you so much. We thank you, thank you that you were obedient. You really, it, when we think about it, you could have said to the Father, I'm not doing this. But you had a whole heart towards the Father. Your heart was not divided. No matter what you faced, and sometimes I think we forget that. We listen to the people crying in the wilderness. But you never cried in the wilderness. You prayed out to God for more and more and more of him. Lord, may we do the same. May we, may we spill over, Lord. May our cups so overflow, Lord, that we don't even realize that we're attracting people to you. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your body, especially your body right now, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. And again, Lord, we thank you so much for your precious blood. We, we, we sang that song, There's Power in the Blood. And there really is, Lord. There was power because you submitted to the will of the Father. There's power because you saw the bigger picture and you, you knew the bigger plan. You did not, did not succumb to selfishness and say, 
I want to live. I don't want to die, but you went to the cross and you shed your blood for us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your obedience and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I um, have an announcement. I'm very excited about this. Um, today there's going to be um, Children's Church, um, an online Sunday school. Thank you very much, Andrea, for doing this. And so I'm just going to read what she sent me so I don't mess it up. If you are a parent with a Zoom link online Sunday school, you can sign in now. Students will start off in the Zoom waiting room and the teachers will admit them when they are ready to begin. If you didn't sign up for online Sunday school and you would like your children to participate, feel free to sign them up at um, the link in the comments. So, so Andrea is so good. She has the links, the link in the comments, but it's lhcfwarn.com slash Sunday school. You'll receive instructions for next week's lesson via email and or text. Thank you, Andrea. So thank you, Andrea, for thinking of our kids and doing this. I think it's a great idea. I'm glad it wasn't up to me because I wouldn't know how to do this. So thank you, Andrea, for um, your knowledge in this area. Lord knows where I would have those meetings and what would be going on. So at this time, I want to welcome um, my husband, Pastor Oz. And he's going to continue on the study of the Psalms in book five. God bless you. Have a great day. Good morning. Well, we're going to um, go through book five. We're going to finish that book up. We'll see how long that takes. That'll mean that uh, the last 150 days we did books one through five. And I really feel it's been this study these last few months on the books that have that is really giving us the the clear-cut picture from the psalms the lord has had our congregation in the psalms for nearly a year now and we have been studying them praying into them and hearing god in them we've also been looking at god's eschatological plan how he establishes his kingdom in the earth and it applies very clearly to what is going on right now, what the Lord did in the Psalms and he did in the Gospels, he's doing now in the midst of the body of Christ. So we are going to finish up book five and then we'll actually go back into the outline of the prophetic nature of the church and finish that up because that is also very appropriate for us now. We are in book five, but what I want to do today is I want to finish up book four. Again, look at Psalms 105 and 106. Uh, then I want to look at uh, the prayer of Daniel, the intercessory prayer of Daniel in Daniel 9. And then if we have time to, again, connect books 4 and 5 together uh, with Psalm 107 and 108, the first uh, two Psalms of book 5. So let's, let's go um, to Psalm 105. Book four ends with Psalms 105 and 106. Uh, book four began with Psalm 90. It ends with Psalm 106. We're going to look at the last two, 105 and 106. The pattern that emerges in book four is that God uses intercessory prayer in his leaders. Psalm 90 begins with the prayer of Moses, the man of God. And as a, the man of God, he's a prophetic intercessor. This theme of prophetic intercession runs all the way through book four. We'll see that in Psalm 106 today. And then Psalms 93 through 100 deal with the kingship of God. When human leadership fails, when the, the leadership of David and his sons fail because Israel under the Davidic kingship, established by God, goes into exile, which is also what book four is about, Israel in exile, as well as Israel in the wilderness. Um, 
we, we, we recognize that though human leadership fails, the kingship of God never fails. And it's the establishment of the kingship of God that in Psalms 90 through 100 brings us to Psalms 101 through 106, which deals with what takes place in the midst of God's people when God's kingship is established. And we're going to start with uh, Psalm 105 here. Now, Psalm 105 begins with the words, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. 106 begins with, Praise the Lord, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 107, then, which is the beginning of book 5, which is the return from exile. God's people go into exile, but God eventually brings them out back into the land to restore them. Psalm 107 begins with, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And Psalm 108, a psalm of David my heart is steadfast, O God, I will sing and make melody with all my being. There's this whole idea of praising the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord. The Psalms move from uh, the first three books of the Psalms, Psalms 1 through 89 are primarily Psalms of lament, Psalms of grief, Psalms of failure, Psalms of crying out to God for his intervention. And then we have this intercessory prayer in book four, Psalms 90 through 106, which begin to look to the kingship of the Lord. And then book five deals with praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord and giving thanks to the Lord and blessing the Lord and seeing that when the Lord's kingship is established, praise, worship, and celebration takes place among God's people. So the Psalms, it's an eschatological plan that moves from lament into praise. Obedience that's required in the midst of lament to obedience that is celebrated in the midst of praise and worship. So Psalm 105 looks like this. When the kingship of the Lord is established, God is faithful to his promises. Let's look at that in Psalm 105. We'll highlight some of the verses. There are a lot of verses, but we'll highlight them. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works, similar to what Jan was referring to in Psalm 111, which is again part of book five. We're still in book four. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Now, now remember, if book four deals with Israel in exile, remember Jeremiah prophesied both in Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29 that the children of Israel would be in exile for 70 years. He told them to prepare it for it. Babylon is taking over. Uh, Babylon is going to destroy our city and our temple and remove us from our land and take us captives to their land in exile. Prepare for it. It's going to be 70 years. After the 70 years is up, the Lord is going to release you. But what did he say? He said, while you're in the land of exile, if you search for me, and you seek for me with all your heart, with all your strength, I will be found of you. So here, as Israel is dealing with her exile, Psalm 105 says again in verse three, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. We don't throw up our hands if our presidential candidate doesn't get in. We don't throw up our hands if we think the wrong presidential candidate has gotten in. We don't throw up our hands and say, it's going to be the end of the nation. It may be the end of the nation, most likely and hopefully it won't. But whatever it is, the Lord says, listen, you don't base your stability on whether you're in the land or you're in exile. 
This is what you base your stability on. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he's done. He's done wonderful works before. If for a time and a season, he doesn't appear to be doing wonderful works, just continue to remember the wonderful works because remembering them reminds you more are coming. Remember the wondrous works that he's done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Now, he, the, the, the psalmist here brings in all these great leaders of the faith in the Psalm 105. We're going to see how God was faithful even through the wilderness, even through exile. God was faithful and he always raised up leaders. And of course, particularly leaders who are intercessors, but he always raised up leaders. And the promises that he gave to those leaders and those leaders spoke to their descendants, to the people of God, God was faithful to keep that. Now that's what Psalm 105 says. When the Lord's kingship is established, God proves his faithfulness to his covenant promises. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, Children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Now, you're also going to see this phenomenon. Remember that the king kingship is gone. The kingship of David is gone in exile, and it never returns. It actually never returns until the person of Jesus Christ. So, so in exile, when there's no more human leadership to rely on, when there's no more human leadership to rely on, then what Israel does is Israel looks to divine leadership and see Israel begins to move messianically. It's in books four, four and five that this, when the kingship is mentioned now, this picture of a messianic kingship, a future leader who will come from the loins of David, a future seed who will be different from all these other sons of David who failed just just as the Davidic kingship did. But the leaders are the ones who are called the chosen ones. Watch what begins to happen in these Psalms now. God's people are called the chosen ones. And you're going to see this, this uh, a great number of reference to the saints of the Most High, the faithful ones. It's not only that God gives the inheritance to the kings, but he gives the inheritance to all his people. The children of Jacob are seen as the chosen ones, just as Abraham is seen as a chosen one. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Jacob, uh, to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. God spoke his promise to the leaders, and the Lord will be faithful to that. And then the remainder of the psalm begins to deal with all of these situations. Uh, that Israel found herself in when they were few in numbers and of little account and sojourners in the land, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. The Lord allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their accounts, saying, touch not my anointed ones, touch not my messianic peoples, do my prophets no harm. See, the Lord is faithful. And what Psalm 105 is showing is even though the people weren't faithful and that's why the people were brought into exile, God was always faithful. He's always faithful. So Psalm 105 says, when the kingship of the Lord is established, God proves his faithfulness to his people as he did throughout all of history. The remainder of the Psalm deals with all these different circumstances. Um, famine in the land and, and delivering the people out of a, a, a place where there was famine to a place where there was plenty. Israel coming into Egypt. God dealing with the Egyptian people who then turned on 
Israel and enslave them. Remember, when you're dealing with the political systems of the world, one who may start like the Pharaoh of Egypt and brings all of the, the children of Israel into Egypt and says, I'm taking care of you, can turn on you can turn on you because because our trust is not in empires of the world, political structures, presidents, kings, emperors, uh, dictators, benevolent dictators and and violent dictators. Our, our, Our trust is never in political systems. God uses them for his purposes, but we do not place our trust in them because they turn on God's people. National interests can collide with biblical interests. National interests can collide with God's interests, and when they do, uh, there's, there's turmoil. We trust in the Lord. Verse 26, he sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. See, the leaders are the chosen ones, but we're also going to find uh, that the people of God are the chosen ones. And this is what happens when there is no king, no no seed of David. It's called a democratization of of God's kingdom purposes. God, God is not limited by leaders. He God doesn't need a leader. Oh my gosh, the wrong person is the president. What am I gonna do? God doesn't think that way. God is not limited to that. He just raises up all his people. He says, well, they don't have any leaders. I'll just raise all of my people up. I'm their leader. And so he raises up Moses and Aaron, and then it talks about all the plagues that took place. The Lord sent plagues to Egypt to set his people free. And whatever's going to happen in America, now God will send whatever he needs to send to get his people free to get his church walking in the power of the kingdom, the power of the spirit, the power of the gospel. It's going to happen. Gee, we've been waiting for this national revival for years. And of course, we wanted a national revival when everything was going well in the country. The Lord says, let's have a national revival when everything goes to hell in the country. God's going to have his way. He's going to have his revival. God's people, the Lord never, never, fails to keep his end of the covenant bargain. And that's what Psalm 105 is. Finally, it says, verse 42, the Lord remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. See, the Lord doesn't forget. We may forget the Lord doesn't forget. So he brought his people out with joy. This is what God does. Oppression comes, God brings us out with joy. His chosen ones with singing. And now it's not just Abraham, his chosen one, or Moses and Aaron, his chosen one. It's not just the leaders. It's all of God's people. His chosen ones with singing. And see, this is this, this evolution that, that, that takes place uh, through the Psalms. We move from strong leaders, absolutely necessary leaders, to chosen people. See, God is bringing his people. The eschatological purpose of the Psalms is the Lord lets things happen, including the failure of leadership on all kinds of levels in a nation and in a church. He he allows the failure of leaders to bring forth what his original purpose was in Exodus 19, when he brought them out of the land and brought them to the Mount Sinai and descended. He said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests, not having a group of priests and the rest of you are a bunch of idiots who need the priests to be mediators between you and God, but a kingdom of priests. What I would like to see coming out of our current circumstances is that the church moves away from this old covenant view of clergy and laity, leaders and followers, to all of God's people being priests, coming into the full priesthood of the Lord. There's still going to be leaders, but but not leaders that replace the chosenness of God's people, but leaders who raise up the believers in the church to be 
ministers of the kingdom as well. That's what the purpose of fivefold ministry is, according to Ephesians. Anyways, we're to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What are we to do, leaders? Equip the saints so they can lead, so they can move in terms of giftings and ministries and build up what? Our leadership, that's an old covenant model. Build up the body of Christ. A lot of these prophets right now who will not omit, admit they were wrong because their reputation's on the line. And of course, you got to, you, you got to, you got to make sure your reputation is justified because what is life all about? Your affirmation as a leader. Not old covenant, false prophecy. Stop it. Admit when you're wrong. Let God be true and every man a sinner. So he brought the people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing, and he gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. And notice it closes with the words, praise the Lord. 106 begins with, praise the Lord. 106 ends with praise the Lord. So 10, uh, 105 starts with give thanks to the Lord and ends with praise the Lord. 106 starts with praise the Lord and ends with praise the Lord. And then as we get into book five, we start with Psalm 111 and almost to the end of the book, praise the Lord begins or ends most of the Psalms. In fact, the Psalter closes the final five Psalms, 146 to 150. It's all about praise the Lord from the beginning to the end. See, we are moving here when the Lord is established as king. See, 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 when, when everything, when we rely on human leadership for everything, there's no praise the Lord because we're just going to focus in on human failure, which is inevitable. Human failure is inevitable. Leadership is a mixture of success and failure. Peter, who, who failed the Lord miserably and became so successful, he still gets rebuked by Paul in the middle of his ministry when he's at Antioch. Just people fail. And then Peter turns around and says, ah, Paul was right. Hallelujah. See, see, Leadership, real new covenant leadership. It's, it's, we support one another, we love one another, we esteem one another, we affirm one another, we correct one another, we rebuke one another, we get back on the, the path. And it's not how dare you say that to me, it's thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Let's get us back on the track. And the track is why? Human leadership is not called to perfection because that would overshadow the glory of the perfect one who has come, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, how does 106 begin? Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Now, we're going we're gonna to see the centrality of the steadfast love of the Lord. You know, in book five, the term chesed, the steadfast love of the Lord, which we've seen a great number of times in the first four books of the Psalms, over 80 times we see this idea of chesed, his steadfast love, his covenant faithfulness, his loyalty to the church, his faithfulness to his promises. In the first four books of the Psalms, Psalm 1 through 106, we see steadfast love over 80 times. In the final book, Psalms 107 through 150, 70 times we're going to see chesed. And I want to make that point. That's my overarching point today. How do we go from lament to praise? How do we go from seeking to be obedient to celebrating obedience in our lives? Through the kingship of the Lord. And when the kingship of the Lord is established, the chief characteristics are his chesed, his steadfast love, and his emit, his faithfulness, his steadfast love. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, 
He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord and declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones. See, when the kingship of the Lord is established and the Lord begins to democratize his grace, his graciousness, and raise up all his people, not just leaders are the chosen ones, all of God's people. What, what the psalmist wants to do is, because of the steadfast love of the Lord, he wants to look on the prosperity of all of the chosen ones, all of God's people, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Now remember, we one of the key passages, in fact, one of the founding passages for the steadfast love of the Lord, we see in Exodus 32, 33, and 34, and we've been talking about it. The Lord is going to destroy the children of Israel because they worship the golden calf while Moses was on the mountain getting the, 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 the terms of the covenant from Yahweh. The Lord says, I'm going to destroy him and start over with you. I'm going to start over with your people who are your inheritance. And Moses says, stop, Lord. They're your people and they're your inheritance. Please don't forsake them. And of course, we know Moses' intercessory prayer moves God. And then, then, then the Lord doesn't destroy him. But then Moses is in a tent with the Lord uh, uh, on the outside of the camp. You know, the, the Lord is, it will, will dwell with Moses and Joshua comes along with Moses, but the Lord's not dwelling in the midst of the people. And the Lord says, Moses says, I'm glad you've forgiven them, Lord, but now would you dwell in their midst? And the Lord said, well, okay. He says, show me your glory, Lord. I, I want to see your glory. Show me whom you will send with us. And what he's really saying, is he understands God sending the angel, the angel of the Lord with him. But the, he says, who are you sending with us, Lord? Are you coming with us? Show me your glory. And so the Lord says, I will show you, you my glory. And, and Exodus 34, which we've quoted the last few weeks, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, the Lord says, all right, I'm going to put you in the rock, Moses. I'm going to put you in Christ. I'm going to put you in the rock the rock that follows the people of God and, 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 and gives them water when they need water, when they're in the midst of the desert and there are no oases. The Lord gives them water from the rock. I'm going to put you in that rock. The rock was Christ, which is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. The rock was Christ. I'm going to put you in a rock and I'm going to go before you and I'm going to reveal my glory and I'm going to proclaim my name. And the name that the Lord proclaims is the one who shows steadfast love and faithfulness to his people. The one who shows graciousness. The one who forgives iniquity. And so this whole idea of the steadfast love of the Lord is rooted in this revelation of who Yahweh really is that Moses receives in the wilderness. When we're in the wilderness, when we're in exile, when it's when we look around and say, all we see is judgment anywhere, look who is coming with us. And the one who's coming with us, this is why the psalmist says, that I may look on the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. See, the Lord was saying, no, they're your inheritance. They're your people. And Moses is saying, no, 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 no. They're your people and your inheritance. And that's what intercessory prayer that changes God's mind must do. In this hour, let's not pray, oh, those idiot false prophet Christians, the ones who are listening to the, to the wrong voices, you deal with them. They're, you deal with them, Lord. No, 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 no. And, and understand, no matter which scenario you think is the true scenario about the president and the righteousness and the wickedness of the nation, well, somebody thinks the exact opposite. There are camps right now that are looking at this camp and saying you're deceived, and that camp's looking at the other camp and saying you're deceived as Christians. All Christians right now believe other Christians are deceived right now. Well, here's what I'd like to say 
Where are the mosaic intercessors who will rise up and say, they're all your people, Lord. They're all your inheritance. So do something about it, Lord. Now, what happens right here at this point in Psalm 106? This is the final psalm of the book four where Israel is in exile. How do we get Israel out of exile? What happens after these incredible statements in, in 105, the Lord is always faithful to his covenant. Out of this beginning rejoicing in 106, there is a confession of sin. If Psalm 105 deals with the fact that God's kingship shows that he's always faithful, well, God's kingship also has to deal with something in Psalm 106, and that's he's faithful, Psalm 105, we are not. God's people are unfaithful. God must deal with the sin issue as the king. The king has to deal with the sin. Well, based on the, the interpretations of the body of Christ right now, based on what I'm quote-unquote hearing God say, somebody's deceived. Those on this side of the argument say, well, those over on this side are deceived. I mean, I don't agree with everybody who's on that side, and I've been told I'm deceived by, by my brothers and sisters in Christ. And my brothers and sisters in Christ over on this side are saying, no, no, you're being deceived. Every, everybody believes somebody's being deceived. God has to deal with deception in the body of Christ. Whoever's right, whoever's wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not making a decision on it, though in upcoming weeks, I'm going to deal with, in the prophetic nature of the church, how false prophecy gets into the church, how false prophecy gets into the body of Christ. How can two people who are in the same room, witnessing the same events, both saying, the Lord told me this, and what each one is saying is completely opposite. Well, the Lord showed me this. And let me give you 17 reasons why I believe the Lord is showing me this. And the other one says, well, let me give you 18 reasons why I'm, why I believe what I'm seeing is the Lord. And you know, most of their reasons are the same. And yet they're still coming to completely different conclusions. There is, there's biblical explanation for why that happens. Stay tuned in the future. We'll talk about it. But, as we come to the end of the exile, what has to happen at the end of exile? God's people must confess their sin. And we're going to see it right here in Psalm 106. The remainder of Psalm 106 is God's people confessing their sin. Now, just keep your hand in Psalm 106, and I just want to take you briefly to Leviticus 26, because Leviticus 26 is going to work for both the remainder of Psalm 106 and for Daniel 9, which are basically parallel passages. What the intercessor does in Psalm 106, Daniel himself does in Daniel 9. And 106, we're going to see the intercessor is Moses again. This is It's Moses praying for God's people, interceding in Psalm 106 to get the children of Israel out of the wilderness and into the land, just as Daniel and Daniel 9 is the intercessor who prays to get God's people out of exile and in back into the land. And the reason for this, it's Leviticus 26. Now, Leviticus 26, all the way up verses, uh, verses uh, 14 through 39, prophesy, even back when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, that's when Leviticus takes place, prophesies that in a future time after the children of Israel get into the land, they will come to a place where they might be exiled. And, and verses 14 through 39 give you all the reasons why God exiles his people. Pretty simple. One word, sin. Three words, disobe four words, disobedience to the Lord. A few more words, forsaking their covenant responsibilities. Now, God never forsakes his, that's Psalm 105, 
but we forsake ours in 106. But here's what happens when you're in exile. Leviticus 26, 40. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me and also in walking contrary to me so that I walk contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they will make amends for their iniquity. Disclaimer, false prophecy, false prophecy is a voice speaking to an uncircumcised heart. Answer, humility, humbling themselves. See, one thing for sure, in this hour, in the American church, the American church is going to be humbled. The American nation is going to be humbled because God wants to restore covenant relationship with his people. He says, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember, that's repentance, brethren. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land, that's Psalm 105. I'm always faithful to my covenant promises. But the land shall be abandoned in the meantime while we repent by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. And they shall make amends, they shall repent for their iniquity because they spurned my rules and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not forsake them neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. I'm Yahweh, but I will not, I will, excuse me, for their sake, remember the covenant with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God, I am the Lord. So back to Psalm 106. Why do we confess our sins in exile? Because the fourth book is the book of exile. We confess our sins to get right with the Lord. He initiates his grace and his faithfulness through his steadfast love to show that he is faithful to his covenant and then we respond to that grace with repentance. So verse 6 of 106, immediately after saying we give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever in verse 1, both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. And then it lists all through Israel's history. It just goes through confessing the sin of Israel. Just a few highlights. Verse 7, our fathers, when they were in Egypt, they did not consider your wondrous works. What did Psalm 105 say? Consider the wondrous works of the Lord. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. They turned away. God shows steadfast love. God's people turn away from it. But rebelled by the sea, at the Red Sea, yet he saved them for his namesake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, Verse 10, he delivered them from the hand of the foe. He redeemed them from the power of the enemy. Verse 12, then they believed his words. They sang his praise and we all went off and lived happily ever after. No, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. They had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. Verse 16, when the men of the camp were jealous of Moses. And see, one of the things, you know, leaders get accused all the time. Jan illustrated that in in, uh, Exodus 16. Poor Moses, poor Aaron. You know why people uh, um, accost leaders, even righteous leaders? They're jealous. They're jealous. It's like, well, gee, you've got a favored status with the Lord. Well, of course they've got a favored status with the Lord. They're being obedient to the Lord. And we want the same favored status and be disobedient. It doesn't work that way, brethren. He loves all his people. He loves all his people. But the righteous 
among us in the body of Christ do have a, 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 a favored status with the Lord. The Lord just wants every all his church to come into the favored status. That's the point of Psalm 105, the democratization. I want you to be a kingdom of priests. You're all my chosen ones. When the men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Verse 19, the golden calf. They made a calf in Horeb and worshiped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of the Lord for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their Savior who'd done great things in Egypt and again, the wondrous works of the Lord. Now, blessed be the Lord, his steadfast love endures forever. Verse one, verse seven, they forgot his steadfast love. Steadfast love is a key concept here. Therefore, verse 23, he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. My wife is here. Jan, I left my cell phone on the fireplace, would you hand it to me? I, I need my cell phone for my multiple translations here. Thank you. Now look what happens here. God is ready many times to destroy his people because of their sin. But thank God for leaders who intercede for God's people. See, this, this is what we need right now. And when we say, God, we want you to change your mind, we understand God did change his mind. It's called Jesus Christ. The Lord changed his mind. He sent his son. He forgave us. But even a forgiven church rooted in the gospel can still enter into unbelief and disobedience. And so what intercessors in this hour are reminding the Lord, not COVID-19, not political division, not division in the church, Lord, but Father, the gospel blessings, pour them out. That's what we're praying. And the Old Testament pattern provides us a model for our intercessory prayer. Again, I repeat, 23. Therefore, he said he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen one. See, this is when, when God's people are, are, are exemplifying the behavior of what it means to be a chosen one. What are they doing? We're always standing in the breach for people. We're not just loving our neighbor, loving our own family members. We're loving our enemies. And if our enemies turn up in the body of Christ because we're opposing each other, those who stand in the gap and say, unity, blessing, healing, break the power of division, those are the intercessors that will bring the church into the kingship of the Lord and will move us from book four to book five. He stood in the breach to turn away the wrath of the Lord from destroying them. It goes on and it, it, it continues to just discuss. The, the rest of the psalm is just about the disobedience of the Lord. And it comes to the point where even the disobedience of the Lord affects Moses. In verse 32, the people were just, God would bless, the people would rejoice for a short time and go right back into disobedience. Moses would pray, God would bless. The people would obey for a short time, go right back into disobedience. This took place for years in the wilderness. And finally, it got to Moses at Meribah. This is Numbers chapter 20. If you want to look at the event in Numbers, it's Numbers chapter 20. They angered Moses. Finally, verse 32 says, at the waters of Meribah. And I'm going to read this from a couple different uh, different translations here. Uh, let me get to um, 106.33. The NIV reads, starting in 32, By the waters of Meribah they angered the Lord, and trouble came to Moses because of them. For they rebelled against the Spirit of God 
and rash words came from Moses' lips. The NET says, they made Moses angry at the waters of Meribah, and Moses suffered because of them, for they aroused his temper, and he spoke rashly. The New American says, at the waters of Meribah, they angered God, and Moses suffered because of them. They so embittered his spirit that rash words crossed his lips. Moses got angry, and the Lord told him to speak to the rock, to bring forth water, and Moses smote the rock. He hit the rock with his staff in anger, and the Lord says, okay, Moses, you're not being the leader that these people need. And because you're not being the leader the people need, you're not going into the land. I'll send Joshua and the second generation into the land. And Teresa Vandervest taught this passage uh, at our Wednesday night uh, Zoom Bible study, and it was spectacular. As, as much as I've, I've um, read this passage, because the Moses incident at Meribah is, I call it my favorite verse in the Bible. People say, why is it your favorite verse in the Bible? Because it puts the fear of the Lord in me. What it says, and, and this, this is for all leaders. Moses is a pattern for all leaders. We must not get angry with the people of God no matter what. We mustn't get angry. Anger is a very serious sin when it comes to from a leader. Now I reminded everybody who was listening that night, we all may struggle with anger, but anger in a leader who is standing before the people of God and representing God as being angry with the people when God's not angry with the people is a very serious sin. It is a what I would call a disqualifying sin. I mean there's there there's sins that disqualify leaders. Um, sexual immorality on the part of a leader, adultery, that's a disqualifying act. Abusing the people of God, manipulating the people of God for your own ends, that's a disqualifying act. Anger is a disqualifying act for a leader. This is my favorite verse in the Bible. But for all I've studied, I never saw what Teresa said. Teresa said that the, the first generation already was disqualified from going into the land. That is, the generation that was Moses' age was already disqualified from going into the land. But there was a younger generation who was going into the land, and what Teresa said was the younger generation needed a different kind of leader from what Moses was portraying. Moses was, was angry and frustrated because, see, his generation failing represented failure on his part. I failed to bring these people in the land. The Lord says, well, no, you didn't fail to bring them in the land. I've got a younger generation that's going to take them into the land, and they need a different kind of leader. They need you to speak to the rock, not manifest your anger toward the rock, toward the first generation who failed. I know that the generation that the Lord is raising up right now, that was a powerful word from Teresa. They need Mike Osminski to be a different kind of leader. So part of this whole lockdown, shutdown, why isn't Pastor Oz having church? Because Pastor Oz is repenting. Pastor Oz is, is, is taking a sabbatical. He's taking a sabbatical from who he is, who he was, and is, is getting before the Lord and saying, I need to be a different leader. And one of the things, one of the most profound transformations for me in this year of being shut down is God is changing my heart. And part of it is changing my heart toward my peers. I, I'm so frustrated with my peers. The, the, it's like nonsense. The nonsense that, that, that many leaders who are my age, who are just clinging to the past, clinging to old wineskins, clinging to an old understanding of America, clinging to old ways. It's really frustrating. But you know what? No anger, son. No anger to them. No anger to yourself. No anger to your family. No anger to your wife. No anger to your dog. No anger to this generation that I'm raising up. And, and, and it is. It, it, took me a, it took a global pandemic for me to realize 
you know, Oz, you're, you're 69 years old and your day is coming and it's, it's time to shepherd the Joshua's and the generation that will continue when you're gone. Spoiler alert, Oz, they'll do just fine when you're gone. But in the meantime, point them to me. Take what I have imparted to you over these years and give it to them. And don't give them a vision of an old America. God help us. An old wineskin church. God help us. Some of my peers, they're teaching the same things they taught 40 years ago. It's like, what's... It hasn't anything new happened in 40 years? So you got it all 40 years ago? Jesus, help us. Now, the end of this, the end of this psalm is verse 43. Many times the Lord delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes. They were brought low through their iniquity. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry for their sake. He remembered his covenant and relented. He changed his mind. That's the same word, Nacham, that the Lord uses. God, Moses, in, by his intercession, got God to change his mind and not destroy the people, but forgive them and not remove his presence from them, but to put his presence in their midst. For their sake, he remembered his covenant. See, God doesn't forget. We do, he doesn't. We're not faithful, he is. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and changed his mind and had compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. See, it starts with his steadfast love in 106.1. The people of Israel forget the steadfast love in 106.7. But the Lord doesn't forget. And see, steadfast love is going to be the key, the founding principle of how we move from lament to praise. What, what establishes the kingship of the Lord is that he reveals who he is. He's the God of steadfast love and faithfulness. And when we see him as he is, we become like him. And that's what it means to be a chassid. Chesed is his steadfast love. A saint is a chassid. A chassid is a chesed one. One who walks in his steadfast love. And see, we need to walk in the steadfast love of the Lord in order to be transformed by the Lord in this hour and have his kingship established in our midst. Verse 46, he caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Oh, this group's going to take over the country. That group's going to take over the country. That's all right. God will cause whoever's in charge of this country to show compassion to his people. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your place. Give thanks praise. We're moving from lament to praise. And so book four closes with these words, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, amen, praise the Lord. Now we're moving out of exile into restoration. Now I, I want to look at Daniel 9, and we may have a couple minutes to look at Daniel 9, but I actually want to jump to 107 and 108 briefly and Take whatever few minutes we have to show how the key of moving from 106 to 107. We've already seen it. It's Moses making intercession. See, Moses makes intercession in Psalm 90. Moses makes intercession in Psalm 106. Book ends. Inclusio. At the start of book four, at the end of book four. And this is what the lesson of book four is. Make intercession for the people of God based on the steadfast love of the Lord so that you might establish the kingship of the Lord. But, oh, don't get angry with God's people. Don't get angry with your spouse who's not cooperating. Don't get angry with your brothers and sisters in Christ who, who are being more influenced by false prophecy than the word of the Lord. Don't get angry. Make intercession. 
Make love, not war, okay? Make intercession, not anger, okay? So we go to 107, and look how 107, it begins the same way as 106. There's a connection between 106 and 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. 106, the end of exile, begins with the same words that 107, the return from exile and to the land begin with. Why? Because what's taking place in the middle? 106. The, the, the leaders of God's people are making intercession. So see, for me, and I know not everybody's hearing this, not everybody's saying this, and people will disagree with me on this. If we're shut down for a year, which we've been close to, and we're shut down for another year, here's what you do. You don't worry about this. Then pray, pray, pray pray, pray that when we come out of exile, when we come out of lockdown and shutdown, there's a different church than the one that exists, that the one that was existed before the shutdown, which was revealed in the shutdown. See, everything that's happened, COVID-19, the civil unrest, the violent presidential election, the seeking to, uh, of, 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 of overturning our nation, which each side is convinced the other side is doing. All of these things didn't create the kind of church we're seeing we have now, where we, we have more solidarity with a political party or a certain prophetic view than we do with our brothers and sisters in Christ. All of this that's happening revealed the church that was already there. We were saying one thing to each other in public and having a divided heart in private. And the Lord just said, enough with this nonsense. Let's bring it all to the surface and see things for what they really are so we could begin dealing with the issue in truth. See, that's what the repentance that comes from in this prayer that Moses prays and Daniel prays. There has to be a realization of truth. 107 begins this way. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. It's always steadfast love. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Trouble is the Hebrew word chaos. Here is, and I, I've said this before, but you might have missed it. Here's how God's eschatological plan works. He lets God's people get into dire straits and great trouble. He lets chaos take over so the Lord can come in, deliver his church, and testify to the nations of the earth who he really is. This is what the Lord is going to do in this hour. I believe we're going to see a manifestation of the Lord that is going to shake this world that's going to reveal who the Lord really is as his people who are in great trouble right now. And we are in great trouble, uh, let's say 98% because of our sin, 1% because of the devil, and 1% because the Lord said, okay, consequences. 98%, it's on us, guys. It's on the brethren you're disagreeing with. And the brethren who are disagreeing with you, it's, it's, it's on us. It's on all of us. It's on us. The devil, rebuke the devil all you want. He's 1% of the problem. Get, get him out of the way. Get his false prophecy out of the way. And then we deal with reality. That's trouble. That's why it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble, from chaos, the chaos of lives lived in disobedience to the Lord, as Psalm 106 showed us. But he's going to deliver us, as the end of 106 showed, as the beginning of 107 shows, as all of 107 shows, as all the final Psalms in the Psalter are going to show. His steadfast love endures forever. Seventy times in these final 44 Psalms. In the first 106 Psalm, has said was there over 80 times, almost as many times in these last Psalms. And when he redeems us from trouble, he gathers us in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and the south. And then it speaks of four groups of people who found themselves in different kind of troubles, how God delivered them all. Now watch. Some wandered in deserts, 
finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. This is the first group. It's a group wandering in the wilderness. It's a group in exile. (laughs) Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Intercessory prayer. We cry out to the Lord. And he delivered them from their distress. Verse 8 says to this first group, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of men. Second group, verse 10. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in iron. Another another group. These are people who are imprisoned. They're oppressed. They're slaves. And what do they do? Verse 13. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, burst their bonds apart. And again, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, his wondrous works to the children of men. Third group. So we've got a group wandering in the desert. We got a group imprisoned and enslaved. The third group. Some were fools through their sinful way, verse 17. And because of their iniquity, suffer affliction. Some, it's their own sin, their own sin has brought affliction on them. Verse 19 says, they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. Send your word. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Send your word and heal them. And then verse 21, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of men. It's the steadfast love of the Lord that moves us out of exile into the land, out of exile into restoration. We cry out to God in our trouble and his steadfast love sets us free. Patterns being established here, brother. This is grace and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness. Finally, verse 23, a fourth group. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, and then they find themselves in a storm. This is now natural disasters. We've got natural disasters. We've got sin. We've got imprisonment. We've got wandering in the wilderness. Just giving different examples of the trouble that God's people find themselves in. Just like Jonah here, there's a there's a great storm and they get cast out of the boat, and they're in trouble. And what did Jonah do in the belly of the great fish? He cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord heard, and the Lord answered. Verse 28, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Verse 31, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. <clears throat> Gotta find my list here of uh, chesed. So we've got the steadfast love of the Lord in verse one of Psalm 107. We've got it in 8, 15, 21, and 31, four different groups. They call out to the Lord, and in his steadfast love, he answers them. And then we conclude, it says, we conclude. Verse 39, when God's people are diminished and brought low, Verse 39, through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes, but he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The Lord takes those who see themselves as something, who see themselves as powerful, who see themselves as anointed, and he humbles them through trouble. And when... They humble themselves in his presence. He raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. He shepherds them. The upright see it and are glad and all wickedness shuts its mouth. And then here's the final reference to steadfast love in 107. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. 
Let him focus, consider, think on these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. And now Jan talked about Psalm 111 and Psalm 112. They're, they're a pair and they begin to deal with this whole wisdom tradition in the church, in the uh, among the people of Israel. Wisdom is associated with people who consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, my final observation, and if we have time, we'll look at um, Daniel 9. If we don't, we'll, we'll give you the general overview. The first two books of the Psalms, Psalms 1 through 72, the majority of those Psalms were Psalms of David. We said that the first, I mean, the Psalter is the five books of David, just like the Torah are the five books of Moses. David's Psalms dominate the first 72 Psalms. But all of a sudden in book three and book four, David has one Psalm attributed to him in book three, two Psalms attributed to him in book four. The prophets take over books three and four. Uh, the prophets, uh, sons of Asaph, sons of Korah, take over book three. And book four is Moses. And, and in Psalm 89, the final Psalm of book three, the kingship is gone because Israel goes into exile. The first three uh, uh, books of the Psalms represents the kingship of David, the kingship of Solomon. Book three is the divided kingdom. In the divided kingdom, when Israel separates from Judah, the kingship has already lost its effectiveness. First two books, David's kingship is exalted. God save the king, may the king live forever. Psalm 3, though, it starts being ineffective, and by the time we get to book 4, book 3, I mean not Psalm 3, Jan said that this morning, book 3, it's a divided kingdom, the kingship is becoming ineffective, and book 4, the kingship doesn't even exist. So David gets one psalm, the first 72, I think, over 60 of the first 72 are attributed to David. Uh, in book three and book four, which would Psalm 73 through 106, that's 34 Psalms. Only three Psalms are of David. I, I want you to see the three Psalms of David. David's kingship is not the issue any longer. We know that man's kingship fails and when man's kingship fails, God's kingship kicks in. This is good news as we see all this failure of nerve, false prophecy coming out of God's leaders right now in the body of Christ. Here's the one psalm in book three that's attributed to David. Go to Psalm 86. We're going to look at 86, and then we're going to go to 108. Now, we're going to look at 86, first of all, and then we're going to look at, oh, I'm sorry, two Psalms in book four, and then we'll finish with 108. Psalm 86. Remember the issue that we ended up with in Psalm 107. When God's people see themselves as poor and afflicted and needy, God moves. Look at the David. This is the David long gone the David who dominated books one and two, this is the only psalm in book three, which is Psalm 73 uh, through 89. This is the only psalm of David. Look what David says in 86.1. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. He's poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am a chassid. I'm a chassid one. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. He's no longer the great king. He's just a saint, a poor and a needy saint. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who come upon you. The only David we see in book three He's not the mighty king anymore. He's a poor and needy one who trusts in the steadfast love of the Lord. Verse 13, for great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. 
O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. It's not the great mighty king and warrior of books one and two. It's one who trusts in steadfast love. David just takes his place with all the other chosen ones and says, we need your steadfast love, O oh Lord. We see David's Psalms twice in book four. I want you to go to Psalm 101. Psalm 101, the one of two Psalms in book four. Psalm of David, I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. We see David a second time, second of three times, and what's at the start of the Psalm? Your steadfast love, O Lord. And finally, the last time we see David in book four, Psalm 103. And in 103, David says, bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Same thing as we see in the, those latter Psalms uh, of book four. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, heals all your diseases, who redeems your love, your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love. Verse four. Verse eight. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accused, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And he repeats Exodus 34, what Moses saw when Moses interceded before the Lord. David is no longer the great and mighty king. In books three and four, and we will see in book five, David's the intercessor who trusts in the steadfast love of the Lord. So Psalm 108, David comes back on the scene. Now we're going to see 14 Psalms of David in book five. We saw all these Psalms in one and two. We just saw three of them, the only three that took place in verse three or four. And he's no longer the great king. He's the intercessor who asks the Lord, like Moses, reveal your steadfast love to your people. And Psalm 108 says this, my heart is determined, O God. My heart stands firm, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. It's now his praise, not the lament of David that we've seen in the previous books. Now it's David the worshiper. Now he always was a worshiper, but it is David the worshiper that is being exalted in book four, and we're gonna see it in all 14 Psalms. It's all about worship and praise as opposed to David, the king of lament in the first two books. He's constantly lamenting. When you're in leadership, when you're a king, when you're leading, when you're ruling, you're constantly lamenting because you're just like Moses, everything that's going wrong. But when you become a worshiper, when you become an intercessor, you're crying out to God for his steadfast love and you're rejoicing in him. And when you sing and make melody with all your being, when your heart is determined to do this, church, intercessors, leaders, people of God, determine in your heart that you're going to sing and make melody with all your being and you will awaken this new song in your heart, this supernatural harp and lyre, which will sing a new song to the Lord and you'll awaken the dawn. And it's the dawn of God's people coming into the throne room of his judgment and the Lord revealing himself for who he is, the one of steadfast love, and it will bring the people out of exile and into the land. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Why? 
because your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. Five minutes, Daniel 9. Five minutes and we will finish. Daniel 9. Just as Moses is the intercessor in Exodus 32, 33, and 34, and he gets God to change his mind based on, he just, what does it mean to change, get God to change his mind? It just means to remind God of who he is. His, he's a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. Just as Moses interceded there, and then Moses intercedes in book four of the Psalms, and David becomes an intercessor. Just as Jeremiah interceded for the people going into exile, Daniel intercedes for the people coming out of exile in Daniel 9. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of the Lord, is an intercessor. And Jesus, in John 17, before he dies, what's the last theological act of Jesus? Before he goes to the cross, he intercedes. What does Hebrews chapter 7 say is the current ministry of the Lord? He lives to make intercession for his people. Daniel 9 says, and I'm watching my clock here for the minutes as they tick away. Yes, Joyce, awaken your steadfast love in your church, in your bride, O oh Lord, there's the spirit of intercession in the name of Jesus. In the first year of Darius, Daniel 9, the son of Ahasuerus, a descent, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. He's the Persian king. The Babylonians have brought Israel into exile for 70 years. God's going to raise up a Persian king to bring him out, and then you never hear anything about the Persian king. Cyrus doesn't become the president of the United States and then do everything good. He, he does one thing for the people of God and then he recedes into the shadows of history. In the first year of his reign, Darius, I, Daniel, perceived in the books, in scripture, the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, 70 years. Daniel doesn't, doesn't base his prophecy on a dream or a vision or Jesus appearing in the bedroom of somebody. He bases it on the written word. Jeremiah spoke this in Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29, and we've already seen Leviticus 26. Daniel is going to take the written word Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 29, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30, 2 Chronicles 36. He's going to take all of these chapters that deal with going into exile and coming out of exile, and he understands the way out of exile is you repent for your sin. Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9, it's a combination of God's people acknowledging their sinfulness, Psalm 106. It's about the Lord, uh, about Daniel declaring the righteousness of the Lord, who he is, that he's the righteous God, and everything that he does or allows in the life of his people, he's the righteous God because he does it as God for God's people to bring them to a place of restoration. And the remainder of the prayer, he's going to cry out and say, now restore your people, Lord. I turn my face to the Lord, verse 3. The Lord my God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. The two Hebrew words for prayer there, one is the Hebrew word tefillah, which means not just the prayer of an inferior to a superior, not just a petition and a request to from an inferior to a superior, but it's drawing near. It, the Hebrew word, the rabbi said, the tefillah prayer, is it draws near unto the Lord based on the covenant relationship that he has with his people. It's saying, Lord, our relationship is broken. I've got a marriage that needs to be restored. I've got a friendship that's been broken. I've got a relationship between leaders and people. I've got children and parents who are not restored to each other, drawing near to 
restore a relationship. And the second prayer is please for mercy supplication. It's a cry for grace. So it's it's this prayer done in the spirit of restoring a broken relationship and asking for God's grace. I prayed to Yahweh my God and made confession. Now, you know Yahweh, which is the personal name of God, the covenant name, whereby the Lord shows his covenant relationship with his people. Yahweh is not mentioned any other place in the entire book of Daniel, except for Daniel 9. Eight times Yahweh is mentioned, and he's crying out for God to restore the covenant relationship. I pray to the Lord my God, I made confession, confession of my sin and confession of your greatness, Lord, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant, and there it is, steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Every term in the Hebrew, there's about seven or eight terms in here that describe God's people's sin is is used in Daniel's prayer. Now notice, Daniel goes from I to we. He starts out with, he starts with, I turn my face in verse three. Most of his prayer is we, we have sinned. First of all, a true intercessor identifies with the sin of God's people, doesn't put himself outside the realm of the sin of God's people. The sin of God's people is the sin of all of God's people. That group that's accusing this group of being deceived are not praying according to the intercession and the pattern of intercession revealed throughout all of scripture where it's not an I thing. It's not a us versus them thing. It's a we thing. As Apostle Reggie Holiday says, it's a we thing. That's the body of Christ. So to stand in accusation against the body of Christ because they don't agree with your prophecies or your understanding of this time, you are flying in the face of God's prescribed process and method of true intercessory prayer until we begin to see it's a we. My brothers and sisters who don't agree with me they're part of me. We have sinned, Lord. And see, the other thing about we have sinned is that if you get up and accuse your brothers and sisters of deception, well, then you better assume that you yourself can be deceived. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. There's this inclusivity in the body of Christ that says, okay, I do think some of my brothers and sisters in Christ are deceived, but guess what? So could I be deceived. See, this is intercessory prayer. And he confesses, we've sinned, we've done wrong, we've acted wickedly, we've rebelled, we've turned aside from your commandments and rules, we've not listened to your servants, the prophets, the real ones who were speaking the truth, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. Let God be true and all men be liars. That's the true position of the intercessory prayer that restores us from exile. See, the us versus them keeps us in exile. That's the whole reason they went into exile because Israel and Judah and us versus them because the 10 northern tribes, you know, split from the two southern tribes because they had a different perspective of the presidential election and they decided to side with their view of the presidential election the kingship in Israel, over against their brothers and sisters, and the split is what led to exile. Division leads to exile, brethren. Division leads to exile, brethren. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all of Israel, to those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you've driven them because of the treachery that they've committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. We, we, we. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law, turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, and the curse and the oath 
that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against them, which the Lord said in Leviticus 26 would happen, Deuteronomy 28 would happen, Deuteronomy 30 would happen. The word of God has already told us. The word of God has told us. Division is not of the Lord. Division has consequences. American church, you're there. Not because I said it. Not because somebody got a vision of Jesus, a dream of Jesus, but because it's in the word of God. The word of God has told us. Verse 12, he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. I did go over uh, five minutes, but we'll be done shortly. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem as it is written in the law of Moses, as it's written in the word of God, as it's written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as it's written in the book of Revelation, as it's written in Paul, as it's written in Acts, as it's written in John and James and Peter, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. So the first 13 verses, he confesses who God is, who the people are, he confesses their sin. And then verse 14 says, therefore the Lord has kept the calamity and has brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works he has done and we have not obeyed his voice. And verse 15 is the turning. Now the petition comes. But now, oh Lord, now Lord, this is the power of intercessory prayer done the right way for unity, for the glory of the Lord, based on the steadfast love of the Lord and not any other nonsense. And now, O oh Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, and he goes back to coming out of the wilderness and coming out of the exile, are the same and now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. And here's the petition. Lord, according to all your righteous deeds, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of your fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all around us. Now, Lord, second time. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, open your ears to the prayers of your servants and the pleas for mercy. Make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear, hear, open your eyes, see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. Here's how you get out of exile. Here's the kind of intercessory prayer. We need to pray for all the body of Christ. We do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus, Lord. Cause us to be intercessors who walk in your steadfast love, Lord, and pray for your kingship to be established that your church might come out of exile into the land, into our inheritance. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Love and serve the Lord.